Good evening. Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Charlie Shields of Wells Fargo Advisors, LLC. We're a member of SIPC. My co-host tonight is Patricia Dunn and Pat from Merrill Lynch, also a member of SIPC. Pat, good to see you. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Our uh, special guest is a cardiac surgeon, Francis P. Sutter. He's allowed us to call him Fran as the show rolls on. This is going to be a fascinating show. We all worry about our heart, so stick with us. We're going to talk to you about your money and your heart. Great show tonight. Okay, Pat, good to see you. Let's talk a little bit about blue chip stock valuations. Everybody has felt safe buying stocks in the United States, especially the dividend payers. And now some of them are getting up to 25 times earnings or some number up in that area. Do you think people should be thinking about shifting a little money somewhere else? Actually, no. I'm staying with the large caps and with the large cap value stocks. Okay. I think the next play is in the value space as opposed to in the growth space. So th not the ones that are at 25 times earnings, but maybe the ones that are at 15 or 17 times Exactly. Earnings. Good. That's, that sounds like good advice. And uh, I agree with you that you have to be very careful because people all over the world have been buying U.S. stocks and they've all bought the same ones and the growth stocks, the valuations are too high. So people should be talking to their investment advisor. Yes. We want to remind them not to time their decisions based on what we're talking about today. It's This is aired at different times in different places, so talk to your advisor. We're not accountants. We're not lawyers. We're just going to try to give them good advice, right? Exactly. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, does the political environment worry you at all? It worries me a great deal. Uh, there is so much uncertainty, and I do believe it's been reflected in the fact that really for the last 18 months now, the S&P 500 has been essentially flat. Sure. It's, it's what it was in the fall of 2014. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two ways to look at this. One is that with all of this uncertainty and the problems with declining oil prices and um, weakness in China, uh, that that's been why the S&P has been so poor, uh, such a poor performer. Another way of looking at it is if we can get some kind of tailwind here, we've had an 18 months of building a base. Sure. And as you know, the longer you build a base, the higher you can potentially go. Yeah. So I think it'll be very interesting over the next year to see which way it goes. Sometimes I think the market is saying, well, the Senate may go to the Democrats, the House will stay Republican, so whoever gets elected, they can't mess it up too much. <laughs> I've heard the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're not going to solve that today. All right, well, how do you invest in small cap stocks, emerging markets, the type of things that people don't pay a lot of attention to, but when you do feel that they should have some money in those type of investments, how do you do that? Uh, Charlie, basically I stick with the ETFs, the exchange traded funds okay. that are dedicated to those areas, but also I take a look in the mutual fund families to see who's been performing in that space Okay, so and take a look at those. So essentially an ETF is trying to lock in whatever the index is going to do minus the, uh, the, the costs of like a 20 basis point cost, two tenths of one percent, and the mutual funds is a bet that we can find a manager who knows which countries to invest in exactly. overseas or which stocks will outperform. And this might not be a bad time to look at some of that because the ETFs have been working better for the last couple of years, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. But uh, don't rule out those uh, uh, active money managers because sometimes in periods of uncertainty, you really need somebody who's been doing this for 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years. I agree with you. Because of the wisdom that they bring to the table. Sure. That an index is just that, an index. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that. All right. Uh, are rates, interest rates going to stay down forever? It's, everybody's <laughs> been predicting a rise in rates and been wrong for three or four years. Uh, when are rates going to rise, or are they going to stay down, or who knows? The, oh, well, who knows <laughs> is the proper answer, but uh, last I heard, um, they're now talking September of this year, and that we may only get one interest rate hike this year, and originally we were hoping for two. And of course, let's not lose sight of the fact that raising these rates is only bringing interest rates back to normal levels. Yeah. It's not like we're going into a high inflationary period. 
It's just that they have been held down artificially way too long. Yeah, and uh, initially their talk was four interest rate hikes this year. Mm -hmm. Now it's maybe one more after the one that we did. And of course, as we get closer to the election, the Fed is probably a little bit of gun shy about not wanting to look like they're getting involved in the politics of a presidential race. Correct, race. yes. So right. that's why it'll probably be September. Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about municipal bonds. It's kind of interesting to me when you see that U.S. government bonds, which are taxable, have lower interest rates when you go out to 10 or 30 years than the tax-free bonds do. So there's kind of an inversion there where you can get a higher yield and not pay any taxes. Uh, so what do you think about investing in tax-free municipal bonds? Actually, I'm in favor of the tax-free municipal bonds. And what you pointed out is absolutely true. Normal times, government bonds would yield more. We're not in normal times. It's mm -hmm. exactly the opposite. Municipal bonds are yielding more. But uh, we have an awful lot of demand chasing very little capacity. And towards the end of this year, we're going to have a huge maturity. Lots and lots of bonds are going to be maturing and in the third quarter. That's going to break people's hearts that we're getting 5% and now it's like 3 or depending on, of course, what your maturity is. You're absolutely right, but it's a built-in demand. Mm -hmm. And you have that kind of built-in demand. You know what that's going to do to prices. Sure. So people who have municipal bonds will probably have more stability. So I'm very much in favor of them. Okay. Do you but feel I, like intermediate term or long term or some of each? How do you feel? I about like that? the intermediates. Okay. I don't want to go out too far on the yield curve in an environment where interest rates do have to rise. Yeah. I, I feel I explain to clients, think of a seesaw. Yes. And if the end of that seesaw is out there at 30 years and the price of bonds is high and then rates rise, the further out on that maturity, the further that s seesaw swings down. Mm -hmm. So they're better off taking a little less yield mm -hmm. by staying in to the seven year or at the most 10. That's the way I feel. Exactly. And another thing I would encourage people to look at is not try to buy your own bonds. Because what the public often does not realize is that the institutions get the first shot at these bonds. Mm -hmm. So go, go with a good money manager. Sure. If you're buying from your individual broker, they've been marked up several times, and you may be able to pay a small fee for munis and still get as good a price as you would have gotten buying directly from your broker, correct? Well, w the money manager gets the best inventory, yeah. and the crumbs are left for the retail market. Okay. And yes, then it does get marked up. Yeah, that sums it up pretty well. All right, well, uh, let's talk about emerging market debt. Uh, Yields are high out there. Mm -hmm. People are searching for debt. Emerging markets have underperformed for a long time. Do you have any desire to own emerging market debt? No. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a, good that's a simple answer. answer. <laughs> yeah, fine. All right. So I think the bottom line of my question is don't just look at how much yield you can get. Exactly. Make sure that the person you're working with understands how much risk is involved with that and uh, maybe you can find something like a real estate investment trust that has a good yield that where you're probably going to get your money but in the in the fixed interest world right now i like will rogers theory i'm more interested in the return of my investment than the return on my investment i couldn't agree more and chasing yield in a low environment low interest rate environment is fraught with dangers terrific thanks pat okay let's see if we can help one of our viewers this is from uh, Jerome Neck of Marion. He says, what's the difference between the date of record and ex-dividend date when making a stock purchase? Good question, Jerome. And I tell my clients that uh, when it comes to purchasing a stock, what's important to you is the ex-dividend date, not the date of record. If you purchase a stock because you're looking to get the next dividend, you want to do so before the ex-dividend date. And if you do that, then you will be um, on the company's book as of the date of record in order to receive that dividend. So don't worry about the date of record. Only worry about the ex-dividend date if you're make, purchasing a stock to get the next dividend. And in theory, when you purchase a stock if they've just paid a dividend that day even the stock should drop 
to yes. reflect the dividend anyway, right? Yes. So if you're if you're willing to wait three months, it's often a good practice to buy it on the ex dividend date because you know you're not going to get the dividend, and you might pick up the stock a little bit cheaper. Okay. Well, thanks for that advice. If you have a question, please send it in. Uh, we're going to give you a uh, video that'll tell you in about 45 seconds how you can get a question into us. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Now to an important segment of the show that hopefully will not affect us all, but could affect any one of us. Dr. Francis Sutter has come in here tonight. He's a, uh, an expert uh, heart surgeon, cardiac surgery, and we appreciate you being here, Fran. Thanks Happy to be here. Great, great. Well, before we get into the latest technology, I'd just like to, you to take a minute or two to give us a kind of history about what's happened in the past with heart surgery so that we can get a feel for where we are now. Okay, well, that's great. So I brought in some posters. Cardiac surgery, doing bypass surgery, started 50 years ago. And what they did is, this is a picture, there's three major arteries on the heart, and you can see there's blockages in each one. The blood goes this way. And with these blockages, the blood doesn't get to the heart muscle. So what we did was bypass this, and we used some vein from the leg, and we went around them. So that worked fine. And then, subsequently, we learned that if we used an artery on the inside of the chest wall, it's called the left internal mammary artery, and we put this to the most important artery in the heart, which is called the left anterior descending artery, LAD for short, if we did this, there was a huge survival difference compared to those patients that had a vein graft here. So we found that this was very important to do. So now everywhere in the world for the most part when somebody does bypass they do they use this internal mammary artery which lasts longer and makes the patient live longer and then we do bypasses with veins to the other vessels because there's not a clear survival advantage whether you use a vein or anything to these other arteries now when we do bypass again we're talking everywhere in the world currently it's a little bit of a this is looking from the top down into someone's chest. You see all these tubes coming out. Mm -hmm. So in most of the world, when they do bypass surgery, they put the patient on the heart-lung machine, they drain the blood out of the heart, goes into the machine, and comes back into the patient, effectively going around the heart and the lungs. And then we put a clamp on the aorta to, s to stop all the blood flow to the heart, and we give a pr preservative fluid that preserves the heart since no blood flow has gone there. And then uh, the heart stopped and you do surgery because you can sew very meticulously with the heart stopped. Mm -hmm. The drawback to this technique is you saw somebody's chest open. The drawback to this technique is you have a bunch of tubes and holes in the heart and the aorta that go into a machine and your blood's being pumped around and the blood cells get beat up by the machine. And another drawback is you put a clamp on the aorta, and everybody that has coronary disease, you know, blockages in their arteries, they not only have atherosclerosis in their arteries, they have it in the rest of their body. It's sort of a microcosm. So just because you're getting your heart fixed, uh, many times you have disease in your aorta. And when we put the clamp on, it can break off a uh, plaque, and that can go to the wrong place. You don't want it to go to your so brain. So some of the sleeping dogs may not lie. Correct. Yeah. So over the years because as you can see I've been around a long time <laughs> <laughs> and I've done a lot of surgeries like this but I was upset at the end because of many cases because I hurt the patient too much 
I hurt the blood too much. I put clamps on the aorta, and even though I've done this I've thousands of times using the machine, I felt that there needed to be a better way because when you get older, just you get your chest sawed open, ah, it slows somebody down for a while. Sure it does. And then all the complications that occur from the, the tubes, the machine clamping the aorta, stopping the heart. Would you like to have your heart stopped? Not no, really. No, nobody wants to have their heart stopped. Right. So if there's a better way to do it without stopping the heart, that's where my brain came from. So what I do now is instead of sewing the chest open, I put a few holes in the, and these are examples of incisions. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously it's a big difference between breaking a bone and an incision this long and an incision, for instance, in this woman's breast. It, yeah. It's like, it's a couple why inches. wouldn't you? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? And the way that we do this, we use a robot. And this is sort of shows what my OR is. I'm here in a console. Patient is here on the table, but I'm in a console here looking in through a three-dimensional picture because there's a camera in here. And then my hands or feet are making the arms of the robot go. And as I work here, it goes through a big computer interface and then the robot is specifically here. And I can do bypass to the most important artery on the heart using that artery that makes the big survival difference. And by the way, that's called the Da Vinci operating that's the system da Vinci, made by yes. Intuitive Surgical if someone wants to look up that company. Correct. Okay. So they have done very well with this. And this is the kind of picture you see on the screens that are all over the operating room. And you can see the instruments that I'm, so my team, they can see what I'm doing very easily. Actually with heart surgery, many times with as surgery becomes more minimally invasive, the assistants can't see very well. But mm -hmm. with these screens here, they can really see. Now, have you clamped off the aorta and stopped the heart? No, we don't have to stop the heart. So 99.4% of all the bypass surgery that I do is with the heart beating oh. and without a clamp on the aorta. So it really makes a big difference. So the way we start out is we put, this is to make it clear the way we put the tubes, the, the ports in that we're going to put the camera in my left and right hand in. And then once it's set up, you don't see very well, but basically this is the robot. It looks like a big spider hanging over the patient and everything's prepped and draped and uh, I have to have a very knowledgeable team that assists me and they have to know as much as I know. Um, because they're standing by the patient. Right. And we put these long skewers. So this is an example of one of the instruments. So did you ever see the, a magic show where the magician is putting swords into a box and a woman's uh -huh. in there? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is what I tell my team. These are lethal objects. They go through the heart, the aorta, the lung, the chest wall, a lot of things. So you really have to have a very finely skilled team that's going to help me. So this is my, my team. And then when we do the surgery, we have a gadget that sort of holds the area that I am going to sew still. The rest of the heart's beating, but this area is still. And this is the left internal mammary artery, and you can't see the artery. A lot of times the artery in your heart that we're bypassing is a little bit on below the surface of the heart. Okay. So you don't see that very well, but this is the stabilizer, and this is the artery that we sewed to the heart. And um, so then when we do these procedures, the patient obviously does significantly better. Now, do you still have the risk of plaque and other things uh, dislocating and moving around, as Charlie said, sleeping dogs no, not sleeping? No, no, because we don't we don't have to do that because we're, we're doing everything without touching the aorta, without putting the holes in the heart for the heart-lung machine. It really makes a big difference. Okay. Now, I know these machines are extremely expensive, so that makes me wonder how many different hospitals have them. Do people like you migrate to a certain hospital that has that, or, or do you use the facility and different doctors use the facility and schedule? It has all that work. Practically every hospital in the Philadelphia area has a robot, at least one robot. 
because not only do cardiac surgeons do the surgery, the urologists, they do prostate surgery, it's big on prostate surgery, hysterectomies, big in hysterectomies, small spaces, doing gallbladders, uh, everything. And as you know, like all surgeons, orthopedic guys have been using arthroscope for years, uh, the gynecologists use an arthroscope, the surgeons use one to take out gallbladders. The only group that really doesn't, hasn't invested heavily into this technology are the cardiac surgeons. Okay. And I'm not sure why. Um, maybe because it's a risky business mm -hmm. and you don't want to have problem while you're learning. Well, you convinced me the old way was risky, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the drawbacks to the robot is, as I told you, there's three major arteries on the heart that we need to fix. And the robot, I can do the most important one, but the other two, I can't do. I can do maybe one of them, but it's a little bit of a push, but I can't do the other two arteries. Okay. So when we come to that situation, this is where 21st century technology with the robot and 21st century technology with stents makes a big difference. Okay. okay. Uh, does this lead us into this cor coronary grafting and that sort so, of thing? So to the hybrid. Hybrid. Which okay. is something that the American Medical Association, or excuse me, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association say that it's a good thing to do. Now, this is the 50 years ago picture, but this tells us in this day and age, if this same patient came in with this narrowing, this narrowing, and this narrowing, there'd be no question in my mind they would get stents. They wouldn't even be close to bypass surgery. Okay. Because stents do better when the narrowing is very focal in a large artery. So this is easy to stent, and this is easy to stent, and this is easy to stent. But that one artery that I can do easiest with the robot has many, many branches. So out of all the areas where they put stents, that artery is the most difficult because when you put a stent in, it's like a spring in a pen. Right. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many branches, you might fix one area, but you might, what we call in the business, jail off other arteries so that the, the rings in the spring are uh, up against the opening of the side branch. Is this done arthroscopic? Uh, Th this surgery? is the cardiologists do this in their cath lab. It's separate okay. from what I do. Okay. Okay. So, but it, what I'm saying is, is the artery that I can fix that I can give a survival benefit compared, you don't get a survival benefit from a stent with this one artery. You come in with a heart attack and you get a stent, you get a survival benefit. But most patients that have to get their heart fixed, they have angina and they're not having a heart attack and they get the stents and they feel better. But it doesn't necessarily give you longevity because you had the stent. You'll feel better, mm -hmm. but it's not associated with a survival benefit. So where we come in here, is the benefit of, of the robot is, is that I can, I can put this artery on the inside of the chest wall to the most difficult artery to stent, and the other two, they can do stents. So in, in the world, when somebody comes in, and let's just say, for instance, this artery, they can't stent, which is usually the case. It's like when somebody needs to have surgery, it's usually this artery is the worst. But the other two arteries are generally not as bad. But in the world, when you only have, when you only have two ways to do things, you either do all stents or you do all surgery, what this is, this is an in-between. Okay. I can do the robot, which gives you the survival benefit, and they can do stents to the other vessels. Is this all in one process where you leave and the other guy comes in or is Well, we do it all sorts of ways. We yeah. do that depends on the how narrowed or significant the lesions are. Most of the time, I go first, mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily have to have it done the same day. There's like when you're doing when you're doing multiple procedures in the same day, let's just say you you get an appendix and your tonsils out the same day. That's hard on the patient. But when we do, uh, we do stents, it's the same thing. It's a little bit harder. So it's nice if you can spread out the, the injury to the patient. So even though having a stent isn't a big deal 
it's yeah. still injurious. All right. So let's just talk about if I do this, what's the difference between a stent to this artery or a vein graft? So, you know, if I'm going to say to you and say, okay, we do surgery, we could do a hybrid, a new technique. Not too many people do it. It's recommended, but it's a new technique. What's the difference between me sewing your chest open, big incision and everything, doing bypasses, and doing what I do, robotic surgery through the small incisions, and do stents? Well, we know that this is very important, but yeah. how does a stent compare to a vein graft? Well, a vein graft, 20% close in the first year. 20% of vein grafts close in the first year. Wow. You mean like collapse? Uh, Done. Just pow. And this is dead. This is across the world. So do over. 20% yeah. close. Okay. Now, be, because you most of the time you have this artery, it, it doesn't have as big of an impact. Yeah. Okay. So how do a stent? How does a stent do? Do they? Close sometimes, but less than 1% in the first year. I'll take the stent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then how long does this vein graft last? Well, at 10 years, half the vein grafts are shut, and of the ones that are still open, half of them have serious narrowings. Well, how do the stents do? 95% stay open forever. Well, sometimes the stents re-narrow. Well, how do the stents do compared to vein grafts? Well, the stents... Um, Renarrow like probably a quarter to a third of what the stent renarrowing might be. So it might not close totally, but basically, I'm telling you, the stents do dramatically better than the current therapy. Okay, uh, this time has has flown by. We've got a minute or so left, and w one thing I want you to hit today, please, is the person that says, "Well, I've got uh, 120 over 80, and I've got a nice low pulse rate, so my heart's fine. I'm sure." Should that person be making sure that things are as okay as they think they are? Or is this somebody who gets indications from high blood pressure and all that that they might be in trouble? Most of the time you get some indication because you have high blood pressure, you have cholesterol and everything else. But it doesn't necessarily mean because you have a perfect heart rate and perfect blood pressure that you don't have coronary disease. So you really need to be cautious. And most people also don't think about genetics. I'm always shocked yeah. to hear that somebody says, well, my father died when he was 42, and I'm turning 42 next week, and I just, well, I don't know, understand why I had this heart attack. <laughs> and it really, it, it is, it's almost like pre-made or predestined almost to the year. It, it, it's, so the biggest thing is, how your mom and dad do and grandparents makes a big difference. Um, cholesterol makes a big difference. And then you sort of have to be, if you have the, the uh, if you have cholesterol and blood pressure, you just need to be more cautious about little chest pains here and there. And there we have to end it. I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, this has been a terrific show and I hope we can get you back. Uh, next week, our special guest is going to be uh, Chris Miles, we're going to learn about technology. He's the CEO of Miles Technology. So we hope you'll tune us in. As far as we're concerned, your money matters.